Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming to my session. I am uh, Dikshita, alias Dixie, and I work for Google. Uh, my co-speaker, who unfortunately couldn't make it to the conference because of personal reasons, is Anti Karvinan, and he works for Intel. So this talk is about uh, advanced memory management techniques uh, and memory QS and uh, some of the NRI plugins that you can use for managing the memory. What is memory QS? So memory QS feature is currently in alpha. It's actually alpha since 127. And with Cgroups v2 exposing new memory controllers uh, like memory.hi and memory.min, we thought maybe we could configure uh, these values to provide better memory guarantees. And um, memory.min, basically, we wanted to map that to the requested memory and wanted to use memory.hi for throttling the workloads so that uh, kernel has enough chances to reclaim the memory before uh, the, container, the containers reach the uh, maximum limit. So all of this sounded very promising theoretically. But when we actually performed the tests, um, we figured that our comprehension of memory.hi did not align with the recommended guidelines. And before we delve into um, what went wrong, what are the key takeaways, and our learnings from working on memory QS uh, feature, I would like to do a quick refresher on C groups and what happens when you uh, create a pod using pod spec in Kubernetes. So what are C groups? C groups are basically a mechanism that uh, allows the processes to be uh, organized hierarchically and the resources to be distributed um, hierarchically as well and in a controlled manner uh, and also in a configurable manner. So C groups uh, have two components. One is the core and the other one is the controllers. So core uh, takes the responsibility of organizing the processes hierarchically and the controllers take the responsibility of distributing the resources across those processes in a controlled manner. So this is what a general uh, Kubernetes node would look like that has cgroups v2 configured. It will have uh, these three slices. One is the cube pod slice, one is system slice, and the other one is user slice. System slice will have uh, all the configuration corresponding to the system services like container D, kubelet, et cetera. And cube pod start slice will then have uh, C group files, basically the slices for each QS classes that the Kubernetes support. So when you create a pod, uh, Kubelet takes care of uh, creating the C group for the pod, and it places those files inside the QS uh, to which inside the QS directory to uh, which the pod belongs. Say best effort, guaranteed, or uh, burstable. The path of the pod C group is then passed to the container runtime which takes care of creating the C groups for the containers and also manage, manages them. So this is what the workflow would look like. When you create a pod, it's passed on to the kubelet, which takes some of the parameters from it, some of the resource-related parameters, and passes on those parameters to the container runtime um, or using the protocol uh, CRI, GRPC protocol. And then the container runtime passes on that information to the underlying container runtime shim. And that passes on the information to the underlying uh, container, underlying low-level container runtime like RunC, which is actually responsible for uh, creating the containers and also configuring uh, the resource values for them. So if this is what your pod spec looks like, uh, and you have the requests and the limits configured, so scheduler takes scheduler uses the CPU request from here and finds a pod that would uh, fit in and is able to uh, run your workload. The container runtime then maps. So this information is passed from kubelet to container runtime. And container runtime maps the requested CPU to uh, CPU weight C group parameter. And if you also have limits specified, scheduler completely ignores the CPU limits. But the container runtime maps the limits to CPU max. Moving on to the memory request and limit. Um, the Kubernetes scheduler uses the request again, just like it uses CPU request to find a pod that would be able to run your workload. But here, container runtime ignores the uh, requested memory value. So we saw that there might be an opportunity to provide better memory guarantees with the cgroup v2 controllers like memory.min if we are able to map the requested memory with that. Uh, and for the memory limits, scheduler ignores the memory limits, and container runtime maps the limits to the memory max. 
So moving on to the particular uh, C group V2 memory knobs that we explored in memory QS. So memory.max, which is similar to uh, memory.limit and bytes in C group V1, this can be used to specify uh, the maximum amount of memory uh, beyond which uh, you would want the ohm killer to be triggered. So when the user just goes beyond this, me uh, this level, the ohm killer will be triggered. And the new controller, memory.min, which we explored, um, as a part of memory QS, we wanted to map uh, the requested memory to memory.min to make sure that uh, whatever the memory is requested in the pod is always available for the pod to run. So, and also from the kernel docs, um, it said that uh, this is the hard memory protection. And if the usage is below uh, memory.min values, uh, um, the memory won't be reclaimed in any conditions. The next controller that we explored as a part of memory QS is memory high. So as per the kernel documentation, it said, if you set memory.high for a process, and if, you're, if the memory usage reaches memory.high, the memory will be throttled beyond that point. And so we thought maybe this is, this is helpful, and we will give, uh, it will give kernel enough chances to reclaim the memory before it eventually gets ohm killed. So this sounded like a happy picture. We have, founded, uh, we have found the uh, controllers that can help us guarantee uh, better memory. And we also explored memory.events. So this is just a readable file that keeps track of how many uh, number of times uh, omkill was triggered and how many number of times memory.high was reached or how many times uh, the memory was throttled. So like I said, this sounded like a happy picture. But it was only when we started experimenting with these values that we found out uh, our interpretation of these controllers was wrong. So what are the possible side effects of mapping, of setting memory.min in our use case? So if there are processes that are actually using lesser memory than the requested memory, setting memory.min uh, would actually reserve extra memory and it won't be usable by other processes. So this can trigger, this can lead to more ohm kills as the memory becomes unreclaimable in each C group. And when the system is under memory pressure, this amount of memory uh, reserved in each C group cannot be uh, reclaimed and ohm killer is invoked. I want to walk over this hypothetical example to explain that. Um, just assume that uh, this node doesn't, reserve, doesn't require any memory reservation to run system or Kubernetes uh, workloads. So say this node has one GB of memory and there is a container one that requests 500 uh, MB of memory and its usage is below the set value, below the minimum uh, requested value, say 300 MB. And then there is another container which requests 500 MB again. And at a certain point of time, its usage bumps up from 500 MB to 600 MB. So at this point of time, container one is using 300 MB, container two is using 600 MB, which is still less than one GB, but ohm killer get, gets invoked because the container one reserves the extra 200 MB of memory, which it is not even using, but it just reserves it. And it, it seems like there is just no uh, memory available for container, do, uh, container two to, uh, to reach the 600 MB memory usage. So at least for our use case, my, my takeaway is that uh, it might be a little aggressive to set memory.min and it could lead to more ohm kills if the user is not responsible in setting the requested memory value, which is more or less a likely case. Now, what are the possible side effects of setting memory.high? So like I said, memory.high can be used to throttle the memory once the usage reaches that level. And beyond that, uh, once it is throttled, uh, the kernel reclaim, uh, triggers the reclaims. So what we observed was, uh, say for example, there is a process that consumes all the memory that was uh, recovered during the reclaim. What can happen is it can just stay in a deadlock, like the process is consuming the memory, it triggers uh, the reclaim, it reaches the memory dot high, and then again, um, it consumes the recovered memory, and then again, it just stays in that loop. So the process will be stuck indefinitely in this case. This is when uh, we reached out to some uh, kernel folks around and got their feedback uh, 
to understand what memory.hi basically can be used for. So they recommended that memory.hi should be used in a feedback loop where there is an external process that is uh, trying to alleviate the uh, mem heavy memory reclaim pressure that is triggered when memory.hi levels are reached. So it didn't fit the use case as well and we had to unfortunately uh, stall the efforts uh, to promote the feature to beta. I want to show, uh, give a demo of um, how that live lock scenario looks like. So say this is a, this is a pod spec uh, that I have. In this, uh, there is a Python command line uh, that runs the script. It basically tries to allocate almost one megabyte of memory in every run and then sleeps for three seconds after that. The request and the memory limits are set. The requested memory is uh, 10 megabytes and the limits are 20 megabytes. I then go ahead and apply the pod spec and the pod is created. We uh, get the pod UID from it because that's what we can use to uh, get the path of the respective pod C group. So I get the pod UID from here. And I continue to watch that pod to see what happens. And in the other tab, um, I do a cat on basically the C group that I have configured, the memory.high value that I have configured in this demo. So if you see the memory.high value that's set is 19, almost 19 megabytes. So the, the request is 10, the limit is 20, and where we want to throttle is when the usage reaches 19 megabytes. And there is this another file which we spoke about, memory.events, which keeps track of the number of times um, the different events were triggered. Now I'm just getting the uh, particular container and watching how the stats uh, look like for this container. So right now the usage is 10 megabytes, which is fine, and it just continues to make progress. And I'm also printing the logs in the other tab from the container. It says that it's still, it's still progressing. It's allocating memory, and it continues. But when the memory reaches the throttling limit, which was 19, let's see what happens there. So I'm opening the memory.events file, which keeps track of the number of times the, the memory was throttled. You can see the memory is getting throttled. And in this tab, after a point of time, the workload is stuck. Nothing happens. And it just continues to get throttled. And you get no signal from it. and it takes forever, basically. So my key takeaway from this was, it's just better to be umkilled than to be throttled forever and wait without any signals, knowing what to do, without knowing what to do. So another takeaway is that if we have a cap that kind of involves, uh, say for example, this particular cap involved a very deep uh, knowledge expertise around kernel, so it, it might be better that we involve the subject matter expertise in the CAP approval process way early on so that we have insights into whether uh, the design looks fine or not. So this is all, all the bad things that happened in this particular feature. But um, we realized that even though memory.hi could not be used to throttle the memory and uh, it could be used to throttle the memory, but it wasn't fitting our case. It can still be used if you have an external process and for other use cases. So for one of the use cases uh, for which memory.hi can be used is you can still throttle the workloads and have a liveness probe which can act as the external process. And uh, when, when memory.hi is reached, maybe the probe can take care of uh, pulling out the process from the live lock scenario and continue. Uh, and it, just, it would just restart the process rather than invoking the ohm killer. The next use case that can be useful is um, to vertically scale the pods, use memory.high as a signal. So when the usage reaches memory.high, throttle the uh, workloads for some time uh, and have some threshold values there. And there can be another process that then uh, scales the pod uh, as needed. 
The third use case, uh, which we are also di uh, going to dive deep into, is maybe memory dot high can also be used to uh, used as a signal to swap out the container memory. Say the usage reaches memory dot high, that can trigger another uh, that can trigger another external process to uh, to swap out some memory, and then the workload can make progress. So today, uh, Kubernetes does not have a full fledged support for swap, but it's still work in progress. Uh, so for the demo, I have a plugin which is a little advanced. It's called Memory QS NRI plugin, which can be used to swap out the memory. So what are NRI plugins? NRI plugin is basically a Kubernetes workload that intercepts the communication between uh, container D and run C. And then you can have different sorts of configuration that you want to modify. So for our particular uh, use case, we are using NRI Memory QS plugin. What it does is it lets you specify memory.high and memory.swap.max in the pod annotations. And once you have these values, you say that, OK, after, uh, after the process has used, say, 90% of the memory, we want to swap out 20% of the memory. So all that is configurable using this um, plugin. So uh, my co-speaker, uh, I'm going to play their recording. They have worked on this plugin, and they have a demo using this plugin to swap out the memory. And now that you know that how NRI plugins hook into the stack, let's take a look into the NRI memory QoS plugin in particular. So you can find this plugin from NRI plugins project, and you can easily install this plugin using help. And this plugin can be configured with a config map where you can introduce memory QoS classes. So you define the class name, like silver and bronze here. And you can also define swap limit ratio for workloads in each class. Swap limit ratio is basically the percentage of the data that should be swapped out when the memory consumption of the workload gets close to the limit. And in the silver case, we say that 20% of the memory should be swapped out when the limit is reached. And for the bronze workloads, we want to swap out half of the memory when getting closer to the memory limit. In addition to these classes, some of the uh, unified uh, fields in the C groups 2 can be directly modified by workload specifications. With this configuration, we allow direct data values to be written to memory.swap.max and memory.high in C groups. And how we are going to then uh, tell this information in workloads. Here is an example of a workload where we define in pod annotations that all containers by default in this pod belong to the silver class. And uh, especially for container B, the memory QoS class is actually bronze. Now, finally, we can specify that container A should have these exact values in memory.swap.max and memory.high in C groups. So memory swap max should be zero. That is, we do not allow any of the memory of this container A to be swapped out. And memory.high should be max. That is, there is no high memory threshold for this container. OK, let's see then how it looks in practice. In this cluster, I have now NRI memory QoS plugin running, but there are no workloads. Next, I'm creating a test pod. And now that it is created, let's see that it has been successfully started up. There it is. And let's take a look into the 
workload specifications. So here we can see some annotations. All the containers in this pod belong to the silver memory QoS class by default. Uh, then there's an exception for container C0 low prio, which belongs to the bronze class. And there's a, a container C2 no swap, where we say that it has no memory high uh, threshold and it never should be swapped. And here are the definitions of these containers so that you can see what they are actually doing. In each container there is DD running, 80 megabytes of memory allocated for the data from dev0 and memory limiting 100. So the system shows now that 40 megabytes of swap has been used and if we see how is the memory of this DD process is doing by reading VM size and VM swap from PROC status, then we can find out that the, there is a DD process that has not been swapped at all. Then there is a DD process where roughly 5 megabytes have been swapped, which means that roughly 80 megabytes of data is kept in RAM, which kind of sounds like the silver class DD because it can use 80% of all the data in RAM and 20% should be swapped when it would reach the limit that is 100 megabyte. Finally, there's one DD where roughly 35 megabytes of the data has been swapped out, which means that roughly 50 megabytes of the data is kept in RAM. So this sounds like the bronze class workload because as you probably remember in this NRI memory QoS configuration we define that the swap limit ratio of the bronze class workloads is 50% at max 50 megabytes in RAM. So far we have taken a look at how C groups controls that is memory.high and memory.swap.max can be used from NRI plugins. And now a bit more advanced look that how memory can be managed in more detail. And for this example, I'm using the memtrd, which is a user space daemon that is able to watch and track and swap and move memory of other processes running in Linux. So in short, MemTRD keeps watching new processes being created inside a C group and that in any can track the memory usage of those processes, meaning which parts of the memory is active and which parts of the memory is idle. This happens with standard Linux kernel uh, trackers like idle pages of Dirty and Daemon. And based on the tracker information and policy configuration, MemTRD policy can then make decisions, move data to another NUMA node or swap out data, which is then handled by mover with the bandwidth that you wish. And now the question is how to integrate this kind of user space daemon into Kubernetes nodes. And for that purpose, we have written also NRI memtrd plugin, which registers to the NRI in the container runtime and starts listening to start container messages, uh, which means that the create container has been already called successfully and there is a container in the system, meaning there are the C groups directories and such already in place. And now Kubelet is telling that we should actually launch a process there. But when this NRI memtrd plugin gets that message that we are starting a new container, it creates a sub process that is a memtrd process. 
and Meditative process starts watching the Cclips directory uh, where the processes of the new workload are being created and uh, based on the data that it gets from the tracker and from the configuration it then makes the decisions that this memory of that workload should be swapped out or moved. You can find also NRI MemTAD project in the NRI plugins and install it using Helm similarly to NRI memory QoS plugin. A quick look on configuration on both NRI plugin and workloads. This is again similar pattern that we used earlier. So we can define classes for uh, workloads, for instance, web idle data class. There we can have a MemTAD configuration, which you can find from GitHub, um, which basically tells that if a container is not using the memory that it has, uh, then MemTAD is free to swap it out without any memory pressure, which then will uh, free more memory to the system. Okay, so here we are. Then we have demonstrated now using C groups controls and using this kind of custom user space demons to manage memory. And now how to improve and how you can participate in this memory management. So I wish to raise two Kubernetes enhancement proposals that are important in this QoS perspective, NRI plugins perspective. First of all, in these examples, we used uh, pod annotations for QoS, saying that we have QoS classes, bronze and silver, and swap idle data. Do these classes even exist? And on the other hand, schedule, like where are the Kubernetes nodes where you can actually use this and that class? And again, like QoS quotas, how many gold and platinum workloads you can schedule on the node. All these are already addressed in the QoS class resources cap, which actually makes the QoS a first class citizen in Kubernetes. So instead of annotations, with that cap, we would be able to say that there are QoS resources associated with a container. For instance, a resource called memory QoS would be class bronze. The second cap is about a resource information. So currently, not all the information that is in the pod and container specifications is passed to the container runtime through the CRI protocol. This cap makes the change that Kubelet is not leaving out any important information that could be useful in the container runtime or NRI plugins that are connecting to the container runtimes. And that's it. Thank you for your attention. I hope this presentation gave you some new fresh idea. There is one more, um, there is one more slide to this. I hope I'm able to move to the next slide. Yeah. So um, like, I, like, like we spoke about the design issues we have in CAP uh, 2570, which is about memory QS. So there are a couple of ideas uh, that people came up with during the conference itself. Like maybe uh, when memory.hi is reached, you have kubelet uh, be the external process and it can uh, reset the memory.hi at that point and then eventually the process gets um killed. So I wanted, to, uh, uh, I wanted to see that if there are any other people who have any other ideas around this and you can reach out uh, to Signode and maybe we can make, uh, redesign this cap and make it work. Yeah, that's all. Thank you.